You're traveling through the unknown, a journey beyond the corners of reality, where the shadows whisper and the chill runs deep. Welcome to the dimension where your deepest fears are given form. This is the Midnight Mystery. A night no longer passes where I do not think of death. Sitting in the uncomfortable padded chair by the window, or propped up in bed and staring vacantly at light night infomercials, my mind wanders to topic like a moth to flame. I'm not a morbid person by nature, but surrounded with death and illness, I can't help thinking dark thoughts. I will be 98 in June, and I've spent the last seven years in a state-run nursing home where death and dementia are an ever-present fact of life. Every couple of days, it seems, someone I play cards or checkers with falls by the way. At night, ghostly moans and mad screaming drift through the long, echoey halls, and if you aren't careful, it will get to you. Nursing homes are where people come to die, and a lot of the patients here don't waste any time doing it. I made my peace with death a long time ago and don't mind dying, but I refuse to turn into a drooling, shitting vegetable, like the ones you hear yelling in the night about ghosts, children running around their rooms, and Nazis peering through their windows. I keep my mind sharp by reading and typing on my old typewriter. It rests on a table beneath the window, where I can pause to look out at the parking lot and the grounds beyond. I write mainly letters, journal entries, and the occasional western. The westerns aren't very good, but they give me something to do. Having accepted the inevitable, I do not dwell on my morality, but lately I've been thinking a lot about it. Not because I fear it, but because of the dreams. In nightmares, I see the faces of the dead, pale, dirty, and spattered with blood. I see their black glinting eyes and feel their cold hands closing around my throat. I wake in a state of panic, and my heart thunders so hard that I'm sure it will give out on me. One of these days I expect it to. It may even happen tonight, or the next night. Before it does, I want to tell this story, for it's this event from my life that haunts my sleep. I have never told it to anyone else, and all of the other men who were there are dead now, and I alone bear its burden. I don't know if I am a good enough writer to convey the terror of what I saw, but I guess that doesn't matter. I just want it off my chest. It was early 1943. After the Japanese bombed our fleet at Pearl Harbor, thousands of young men across the US heeded Uncle Sam's call and joined the service. I was one of them. I was 18 at the end of 41 and enlisted in the Marine Corps. I was sent to Paris Island in 42 and learned how to shoot kill, starve, and keep going, even when I felt like my body was going to fall apart like an old jalopy. In boot camp, they called me Bugs, after Bugs Bunny because of my teeth. Our drill sergeant had a nickname for everyone, and mine was one of the milder ones. When I was trained up, I shipped out to the Pacific in the summer of 42. The Japanese S at the time had overspread much of the region with little resistance, and set up shop on many of the little islands in that big ocean. Now, when I say Japanese, I'm not picking on them. It's just shorthand. Before I met my first Japanese, I feared them. But after, I respected them. They were the toughest sons of bitches you ever wanted to meet. They were brave, loyal, and committed to their cause. You never, ever saw a Japanese desert or cower in the face of battle. Of course, we didn't know that as we plowed through the Pacific on our way to fight them. We were young and full of piss and vinegar. We thought we mopped them up in a week. They were weak, we thought. Tiny, real jerks. We quickly learned we were wrong. Two weeks after departing Los Angeles, the last great outpost before the vast ocean, we landed on an island called Mukiko. It was a rocky hump of jungle where the Japanese S had set up an airbase and a radar station that tracked incoming planes. I first spotted it from a distance, and backlit against the piercing blue ocean and dusty sky, it looked like a nice place to vacation, till we started bombing it. For almost 12 hours, a dozen ships hammered the island, the big guns booming and spitting firing hard enough to knock you off your feet. Our planes hit it from the air, and early in the afternoon, some 1,400 men climbed over the side 
down big rope nets, and piled into landing crafts. Clutching my rifle to my chest and watching that little strip of land getting closer and closer, all the bragging I did on the ship came back to bite me. At least the others felt that way too. We were grimly silent as the little boats puttered toward the shore, no one speaking, everyone staring fixedly ahead, wondering am I going to die today? The landing went smoothly enough. The boats reached the coastline. The doors dropped open, and we stormed up the sandy beach. There were machine gun nests just inside the jungle, and they came to life, chopping foliage like salad. We threw ourselves to the sand and fired back. I caught a glimpse of a couple Japanese S in their tan uniforms, and it was the most surreal sight I ever saw. We had heard so much about them and had talked them up among ourselves until they weren't men anymore but mythical creatures. It was like seeing Bigfoot or a pack of unicorns. After the fighting on the beach, we tramped into the foreboding jungle. We met some resistance, but made it to the airfield without much trouble. It was laid out in a little grassy valley. The buildings were abandoned, rice still warm on stoves. We took down the imperial flag and ran up the stars and stripes, everyone cheering. We lost 25 men that day and thought the battle was over. We were wrong. The Seabees came in the next day and rebuilt the runway and the earthworks that had been destroyed in the bombing. The radar station fell that day after a hell of a fight, and they started working on that too. We thought we'd flush the Japanese S out entirely, but they kept popping up. They'd attack with rifles and grenades, then fade back into the jungle like they'd never been there at all. We sent out patrols and they kept getting ambushed. A few of our boys even stepped in punky pits, big holes drug in the ground, filled with sharpened sticks and covered by foliage. You wouldn't notice it until one of those spikes drove through your foot. The Japanese S even smeared shit on the tips so you'd get infected. We heard from somewhere, high command most likely, that there was a Japanese unit dug in somewhere on the island. I can't remember exactly where that came from. It was almost 80 years ago. But by our second week on the island, we were carrying out daily searches for the stronghold. We knew it was somewhere, but it was so well hidden that we couldn't find it. For that first week, there was a lot of activity around the island. Japanese planes and ships came out of the wild blue, and heavy fighting between our fleet and theirs raged for days on end. The planes never dropped bombs, only boxes, resupplying the Phantom unit. We managed to cut them off, and the supplies stopped coming. The hit-and-run attacks continued, however, so we knew that the Japanese soldiers hadn't been evacuated. We didn't know how many there were, but there couldn't have been many of them, as their hideout was so well concealed that it had to be small. Slowly, the attacks dwindled, and a sense of restlessness came over the camp. We played cards and listened to the radio between patrols. We played baseball, tacked pictures of Mae West and Betty Grable to our walls, and talked about home. I got to know some of the men pretty well during this time. There was Stevens from Louisiana, a tall, muscular roughneck with leading man good looks. Curly, a short and bespectacled guy from Brooklyn who sounded just like Curly from the Three Stooges shorts. I think his real name was Sam. And Washington, one of only two black men on the island. Stevens was a card shark and was always scratching up games on crates that served as tables, shirtless and chewing a lucky strike. He'd take us for all our rations and care packages if we let him. Of all the men in our unit, he was the loudest in his dislike of Washington. He'd let the black man play cards, but he'd pick on him the whole time. That's your hand, neighbor? He'd ask patronizingly during games. He didn't say neighbor, though. He said another word that started with N a word I never much cared to hear and won't repeat. Well, take a look at this hand. He'd slap down a flush and laugh around his cigarette. This can buy a whole lot of watermelon. Washington took it in stride for the most part. He told me once that if he reacted, Stevens would never let him alone, and I believed it. I've known many men like Stevens. Once they know they're getting to you, they push harder. The days turned into weeks, and the weeks into a month. Every day we searched for the hideout and patrolled the parameters of our holdings. 
I remember it being well known that the men we were looking for had to be running out of supplies. But I don't remember getting a signed letter from the Navy telling us this, so I can't recall where it came from. Our mission became to wait them out. One day in early September, Stevens, Curley, Washington, and I were on patrol well to the west of the airbase. Being the tropics, it was hot and humid, and within five minutes our shirts were soaked in sweat. Bugs buzzed around our heads and bright shafts of sunlight filtered through the treetops, dappling the jungle floor with golden coins of brilliance. Stevens was picking on Washington again, and Washington was getting tired of it. You think the Japanese s like dark meat? Stevens asked. If they're so hungry, why don't we go feed them? Washington turned around and faced him. Man, will you stop? He asked tightly. I'm getting real tired of you. Stevens plucked his cigarette from his mouth with a flourish. I was tired of you the first time I saw you. Curly and I had stopped. I started to call out for them to knock it off when something crashed into me from the side, almost knocking me down. I spun and brought my rifle up. A Japanese soldier, his tan uniform dirty, wrinkled and hanging from his thin frame, thrashed it in the leaves, trying to get up. Holy shit, Curly said. It's a Japanese. Forgetting their feud, Stevens and Washington hurried over and put their guns on him. The Japanese struggled to his knees, grabbed my pant leg, and looked up at me. In all my time before and since, I had never seen such fear in a man's face. His dark eyes were big and watery, and his mouth was twisted. In a silent scream, tears oozed down his hollow cheeks and he shook like a frightened dog. He was barely aware of our guns as he pointed back the way he had come and spilled out a stream of gibberish. I didn't know what he was saying, but he sounded terrified. What's wrong with him? Curly asked. I don't know, I said. It's a trap, Stephen said. He slung his rifle over his shoulder, pulled his 45 from its holster, and aimed it at the Japanese is head. The Japanese paled and began to sob. I knocked Stephen's arm aside. We're taking him prisoner, I said. Stevens argued as I tied the Japanese is hands behind his back, but I ignored him. The sun was starting to set by now and shadows filled the jungle. The Japanese moaned in fear and a chill went down my spine. I looked around, spooked by his terror, but saw nothing. We started back up the trail and a few minutes went by before the snapping of twigs off to our left stopped us. Twilight had come rapidly and it was hard to see through the trees. What was that? Washington asked in a whisper. I don't know, I whispered back. I had been holding the back of the Japanese's shirt with my hand. I let go and brought my rifle up. The Japanese let out a miserable moan and stomped his feet like a child. He said something to me that I didn't understand, but his mix of fear and frustration formed a universal language all its own. More twigs snapped and I looked around. In my memory, it happened like this. An errant shaft of moonlight suffused the forest, and as I turned, I caught sight of a terrible face watching me from the bush. Its skin was white and streaked with dirt, its mouth open wide in animal anticipation. Blood ringed its tattered lips and saliva coated its crooked and broken teeth. Though it has to be a trick of memory, I swear its eyes were shining yellow like a big cat's, and that the smell of death and decay rose from it in sickly sweet waves. I gasped, and suddenly they were on top of us, a half dozen ghouls in shredded uniforms, their skeletal hands clutching, their bony ribs leading the way. We all screamed and the Japanese bolted up the path, his head bent to cut down on wind resistance. One of the things grabbed the front of my shirt and dragged me forward, its mouth opening as if to suck me in. Panicking, I smashed the butt of my rifle into its sunken stomach. Another grabbed me from behind and bit down on my shoulder. Pain shot into the center of my head, and blood spurted from the wound. Washington fell back against a three-three ghouls shambling toward him. He brought his rifle up and fired, hitting one in the chest and knocking it down. Stevens gaped in horror, then whipped out his forty-five as two more things advanced on him. He shot one and it dropped. The other lunged at him and sank its teeth into his arm. Stevens screamed, then rammed his knee into its chest, unlatching its jaw. I slammed my elbow back into the ghoul's stomach, and it released me. I shoved him away and threw myself frantically down the path, the others following me. What the fuck? Stevens screamed. That fucker tried to bite me. 
Washington kept saying over and over again, his tone shocked and offended. Curly blubbered like a baby. We didn't look back, but we knew they were coming after us. We could hear their excited hissing and deathly moans, so much like the moans here at the nursing home. We came across the Japanese a little while later. He lay on the path, dead. Three of those things kneeling over him, their hands shoved into his gaping stomach cavity. What the fuck? Washington asked, disgusted. The things looked up at us and seemed to delight in our presence. Stevens shot all three of them and we continued running. When we reached the airfield, a group of men ran down to meet us, drawn by the screaming and gunfire. We told our commander, Commander Casey, what had happened, and he didn't believe us. Monsters? he asked, as though he hadn't heard right. Are you boys going soft in the head? No, sir, Stephen said. He held out his arm. Look. Commander Casey examined the wound. Just then, an animated chatter went through the crowd. In the moonlight, the things that had chased us stalked from the forest, some of them carrying swords. They were little more than shadows, and the noises they made came straight from the pit of hell. We saved five of them, then ten, then more. All staggering out of the jungle and spreading out like cockroaches, the tower shone a searchlight on them, and they came alive, running at us full speed with their swords. In the light, they were white and red with death and blood, and their bodies were little more than bones held together by sallow skin. The machine guns opened up with a roar, and bullets cut down many in the first rank. Men grabbed their rifles and took up position on the edge of the camp, kneeling and firing as the living dead advanced. More came, throwing themselves mindless at us, with no regard for their own safety. The boys with their rifles broke and ran, scared, and I saw one of the things jam its sword through the belly of an American and rip out his throat with his teeth. By now, every man had come down to join the fight. One of the things came at me, and I took its head off with a burst of fire. One tackled Washington and scrambled on top of him. Before it could bite him, however, Stevens jammed the barrel of his 45 against his head and pulled the trigger, painting the grass with its blood. Stevens reached out his hand. Come on, neighbor, move your ass. Washington took his hand, and Stevens helped him up. Soon the dead stopped coming, and the ground was littered with corpses, some moving and snapping their teeth, others dead. One of the things was only hit in the legs, and our boys took it prisoner. I can't remember how long it took to find this out, but in my memory, it happened that very same night. Those things, the walking dead, were men. The Japanese holed up in their bunker and cut off from Japan and with no hope of escape or resupply, had gone mad with hunger. Their bodies wasted slowly away and their minds did too. Days stretched into weeks, and the hunger pangs became too great, consuming their minds, bodies, and souls. Finally, like wild animals, they turned on each other. A few managed to keep their wits about them and escape, but the others killed and ate their fellow soldiers before spreading out into the jungle. I've thought often of those men over the years, the terror and hopelessness, the deep, aching pain of starvation, of their skin shrinking around their bones, of them slowly going mad in a dark subterranean pit, thousands of miles from their homes and their families. Starving the enemy out that way wasn't a war crime, but it feels like one. And when I think of dying, I think of that face I glimpsed in the jungle, the one with yellow eyes and ragged lips. I think of it a lot. Did anyone else become a participant in the social experiment known as Flat Stanley? I went to elementary school in the mid-90s, 95, 2001, and I was in third grade when our teacher announced that we would be taking part in the Flat Stanley Project. For those of you unfamiliar with the concept, Flat Stanley was a series of books about this flat kid who goes on all these weird adventures to famous places. New York, the Grand Canyon, France, Australia, this guy went everywhere and was like a flat version of Curious George. We started reading them in class, making them part of our English hour, and one day, Mrs. Gazzle told us we were going to have a contest. Today's English lesson is to create your own flat Stanley. It can look however you want, but the winner of the contest will get three prizes from the prize basket and be the class's flat Stanley that we send into the world 
to participate in the Flat Stanley project. We were all excited. This was a chance to see our work in the pictures that would come back, not to mention get some cool stuff from the prize basket. We all drew out our own concept for Flat Stanley and set to work coloring and designing him. My Flat Stanley was a spy, wearing a big trench coat, a wide hat, and carrying binoculars. He wore his regular clothes under it, and he just looked so goofy that I thought I had a real chance of winning. My friend, Todd, laughed when he glanced over at it, telling me it was cool. His flat Stanley was a football player for the Georgia Bulldogs, his favorite team, and I thought his Stanley looked cool too. So when the class voted on the displayed Stanleys, I figured Kaylee's flat Stephanie would win. It had a sparkly tiara and a ball gown she had made with felt. That was the one I had voted for at least, since we couldn't vote for our own, and if not hers, I figured Matt's would win. His flat Stanley was a truck driver, complete with a net hat and sleeveless t-shirt, and he had put a lot of work into it. I knew some kids thought mine was funny, but I didn't figure I stood a chance. I hadn't used any special materials or done anything really innovative, and I figured I'd hang him in my room when I got him back. So when Mrs. Gazel announced that my flat Stanley had won, I was shocked. I went home that night with a new super bounce ball, a pocket-sized stretch arm strong, and an eraser shaped like a Pikachu. I also went home to tell my mom that I had won the contest, and that my flat Stanley would be going out to other schools and other places so we could get pictures back and see all the cool places he'd been. She said that sounded really neat, and we brainstormed where he might end up. Paris, Disneyland, the moon, we both laughed about that one. Or maybe even at an Atlanta Braves baseball game. We had a good afternoon thinking about where he might end up, and when Dad got home he joined us in our daydreaming. I went to bed that night thinking of all the cool places Stanley might go, and what we might see when he came back. It started out pretty normal. Mrs. Gazel sent the package out to a school the next town over, and they sent us back pictures a week later. Stanley had been to a volleyball game, an art museum, and finally to play put on by the class. They sent it up the road to the next school, where Stanley went on a hike, went to the zoo, and then to a baseball game. It wasn't the Atlanta Brave, it was a t-ball game, but it was still neat. This went on for a couple months, flat Stanley traveling to Texas, New Mexico, California, Idaho, and Kansas. We hung the pictures up, sent out thank you cards, and talked about the places that Flat Stanley had gone to. It was a good time, and we used it in our geography class to help us learn our states. It seemed that Flat Stanley was in all our lessons that year. Math, if Flat Stanley travels from Burbank, California to El Paso, Texas, how far has he traveled? Geography, if Flat Stanley is at the Alamo, then where is he? And of course English, where we read the books and the letters we got out loud. It was approaching April when we came to class to find that Mrs. Gazel wasn't there. We were all pretty bummed, because Wednesdays were usually when we got our flat Stanley letters, and the sub told us that Mr. Gazel would talk about it when she got back. There was no flat Stanley that day, and when Mr. Gazel came back the following week, we moved on to something else. All the Flat Stanley stuff had disappeared from the class, and its absence was as noticeable as our missing teacher had been. She never told what had happened, and it was a mystery talked about in hushed tones well into the fourth grade. It would probably still be a mystery if I hadn't decided a decade later to pursue teaching. I'm in my second year of college now, and I've progressed into student teaching. I decided that I wanted to try my hand at being an elementary school teacher, something like fourth or fifth grade, and when they gave me the name of my mentor, I realized I knew her. It was Mrs. Gazel, my old third grade teacher. She taught fifth grade now, her retirement coming up on the horizon, and she smiled when she realized who I was, giving me a big hug. Welcome back. I'm glad to see you decided to take up teaching. Her classroom was in the same room her third grade class had been in, and the kids reminded me a lot of me and my friends when we had been her students. She had a good group. They were hungry to learn, and they liked her a lot. Mrs. Gazel was the kind of teacher who kept kids' attention effortlessly, and I hoped it was a skill I would learn from her. The kiddos in her class took to me pretty quickly, and soon I was teaching classes while Mrs. Gazel just sat back and observed. 
Something about being in her class again made me remember my days as a third grader at this school, and that made me think about Flat Stanley again. There was nothing like that in her fifth grade class. The kids would have probably thought it was babyish, but it did rekindle some of the mystery I had felt from a decade before. I tried to find a good time to bring it up, but nothing seemed to present itself. Until Friday of my second week. I was packing up to leave when Mrs. Gazel offered to take me out for drinks. I was a little surprised, and she must have noticed because she laughed airily at my look of chagrin. What? She asked, her coat over one arm. You didn't know teachers drank? I decided to join her, and found a small group of other teachers waiting for us when we arrived. Some of them I knew, most of them I didn't, but it turned out that this was a regular thing for them. They drank and talked about their week, complaining about some students who were especially difficult and generally blew off steam. Mrs. Gazel and I sat in the corner, nodding and listening to them, and she smiled at me over the lip of her fourth glass of wine sometime near eleven. I've been sending glowing reviews to your professors, she confided. You're one of the better student teachers I've ever worked with. I think you're probably a shoe in to be hired at the end of your training period, and I'll recommend you to the principal myself if he doesn't extend you a position. I thanked her, sipping my second beer as I took it all in. Hey, can I ask you something? I said suddenly. Neither of us is nearly drunk enough for you to offer me a ride home yet, big fella. She said, snorting into her glass. No, no, nothing like that. Something's always bugged me from my time in your class, and I was wondering if you remembered the Flat Stanley project we did. Some of the color fled from her cheeks, and I could swear she shuddered a little. I'm surprised you even remember that. It was a long time ago. Well, everything disappeared from the class so quickly, and when you came back, you never brought it up again. All the books were gone from the class library. All the letters were gone. Everything was missing. I think we talked about it for half of the fourth grade before something else caught our attention. She looked far away for a moment, as if contemplating whether she actually wanted to answer me or not. I think I need a little air. Would you care to escort me? I told I would, and we left amidst a hail of cat calls about cradle robbers and cougars on the prowl. I had taken her arm, and she was trying to be unbothered by it, but she was stiff and a little unsteady as we walked out onto the patio. Something had her spooked, and I didn't think it was the half-hearted teasing of her peers. When we came outside, she leaned against the railing outside the seating area, looking at the waves as they crashed against the water below us. I came to lean beside her, realizing she was trying to figure out where to begin and having trouble getting started. Are you sure you want to know? That's a pretty messed up story, but I suppose we could count it as a part of your education. Maybe it'll help you avoid something that got me in a lot of hot water and canceled the Flat Stanley project for the whole school. I told her I did, pretty intrigued with what could have happened to make a whole school ban something as benign as a kid's art project. Well, you remember that we sent the little guy around to a school in the next town over? Well, they sent it to another school, and that school sent it to another school and so on and so forth. We had about the best result of any other classes, getting back twice as much material as is normal. I started integrating it into the curriculum, as you remember, and it was such a huge part of our class. I appreciated the material, sometimes it's hard to keep kids' attention when they're that young, but Stanley really helped. Then, one day, I arrived to find that a new package had come the day before. She stopped, shivering a little as she watched the waves. Someone had sent our flat Stanley back, and I was excited as I opened the envelope. We were starting fractions that day, at least we were supposed to, and I wanted to see if there was some way I could work fractions into the package. I would get my wish, but not in the way I wanted. I had reached into my pocket for a cigarette, and Mrs. Gazel asked if she could have one. I had never seen her smoke before, but as she inhaled that first mouthful, she closed her eyes and looked euphoric. Flat Stanley was supposed to go to Carter Wilde Elementary School in Boise, but it appeared he had gone somewhere else. You're too young to remember it, but there was a pretty terrible person in the Midwest in the late 90s. He was picking up young women who were hitchhiking, and the police would find them later after he was done with them. Somehow he got our Flat Stanley and thought it would be funny to use him to taunt the police. He had murdered five girls that week, 
Her voice broke as she said it, the tip of the cigarette jittering as she spoke, and attached pictures of them to the Stanley he sent back. They were horrific, and as I spilled them out on my desk, I recognized what I had at once. She was shaking, and as I put my jacket around her, she smiled ruefully at me. Ting. You're a good kid, despite making me relive this. We knew that the kids in my class had all kinds of wild ideas about what had happened, but we also knew that none of you knew the truth. She took a long pull off the cigarette and let the ash dribble down. The first girl he sent pictures of was Ashley Manxie. He had cut her chest open, the X going right between her breasts, and skinned her open like some kind of flower. Her face was set in the worst possible look you've ever seen, and right there in the middle of her chest was Flat Stanley. Your Flat Stanley. I thought I got it then, but Mrs. Gazzle hadn't even got rolling yet. Then there was Frances Carmichael, the girl he took from the fair. She was looking for a ride, and he gave her one. He cut her arms and legs off while she was alive, burning the wounds closed with an iron so she'd bleed out slower. He finally cut her throat, and after that, he put one foot from that flat Stanley in her teeth and took a picture. He was standing upright, her body on display, and her burnt nubs are something I still can't quite get out of my head. I'm sorry, I started, but she cut me off. No, no, you wanted to know, so let me get it all out. It's like the confessional I used to go to when I was little. If I get it all out, maybe it won't haunt me as bad. He got Don Cambridge and Betsy Cambridge next, split their backs, and made a pair of blood angels out of them. He set Flat Stanley in the middle of them, the crevice between their sides, and snapped a picture. They were still looking for them when they found Ashley. Finally, he got Melanie Fasterly, and she was probably the worst. He beat her with a sledgehammer until her bones were like glass shards. The picture he sent back was unrecognizable as a human being, and if it hadn't been for the hair I would have never known what it was. He stood the cutout between her lumpy legs, as if to save her modesty, and she honestly looked about as flat as he was if you don't count all the bone spurs sticking out of her. Mrs. Gazel's jaw was shaking, the skivering causing her to stutter over the last few words, and when she looked back at me, there was regret on her face. All the alcohol had been burned out of her, the fear having shaken it all loose as her mind remembered what had likely been the worst day of her life. I called the police, of course, but my real concern was for you guys. If this psycho had mailed this back to us, then he had the address of the school. If he knew where we were, then he could pay us a visit and make us his next photo collage, and I couldn't have lived with myself if that had happened. So I gave the police everything, and they agreed to keep an eye on the school for a while. I needn't have bothered. This twisted fuck had a particular hunting ground and a particular prey, neither of which were children in Georgia. He never did pay us a visit, but it took six more girls before they caught him. I didn't sleep well until they had him in custody, and I didn't sleep soundly until they slipped the needle into him last year. He was a rotten, twisted individual, and he deserved every ounce of what he got. I had to take the rest of the week to recover from his little present, and there was talk that they might want me to undergo counseling. When I got back, the school had scrapped all the flat Stanley stuff. It was too much of a risk that some students would get a hold of it next time, and they couldn't have that. Some of the teachers thought we should tell the students, some of them thought we should tell the parents, and a few of them thought I should be fired for some reason. It was decided that we wouldn't tell any of them, and we would never speak of it again. In exchange for not causing an uproar, I got to keep my job. I thought it was a pretty fitting trade back then. So that's the whole sad story. Cure your curiosity. It did. Mrs. Gazel was right, too. They offered me a job at the end of my training, and it turned out it was her job. Mrs. Gazel retired at the end of that year, wanting to spend more time with her grandkids and her daughters. We still get drinks sometimes, and she really is a lovely woman. As for me, I noticed one major part of the contract as it was presented to me. They put it in bold so you can't possibly miss it, and so if you break it, you really only have yourself to blame. Under no circumstances will our students participate in any program that sends documents to other schools or entities without the express permission of the administration. This includes pen pal programs, Hands Across the Water, the Flat Stanley Project, and other affiliated projects there within. I signed that contract 10 years ago, and now I instruct student teachers myself. 
In the decade I've been teaching, I have never broken that rule, and I have Mrs. Gazel's story to thank for that. When you send something like that out into the world, you never know who might answer back and what they might have to say. My daughter and I moved into the third floor unit of the Angel Trace apartment complex a few months ago. The seven-story building jutted up into the smog-filled, dreary sky like a tumor. This town of Frost Hollow seemed like it constantly rained, and no matter how high I turned up the heat in the apartment, I always felt cold. Surrounded by condemned factories and dead, leafless trees, the area around Angel Trace looked depressing enough to suck the life out of even the most optimistic person. The streets always stayed dreary and empty. My neighbors around the apartment complex would walk around, hunched over and glassy-eyed, looking as depressed and hopeless as an inmate heading to the gas chamber. I would catch glimpses of something extremely thin and tall, a pale form barely visible in the blackness slinking its way through the dark room when I lay down to sleep. But whenever I looked over, I would find just an empty wall of mocking shadows waiting for me there. I started to wonder if perhaps I was hallucinating. I wondered if there was something in the walls of Angel Trace itself, some sort of black mold or toxic chemical that could cause me to see things that weren't there. Angela was home from school for Christmas break. Though our place was small and dingy, pressing in on me like a coffin, Angela didn't seem to mind in the slightest. Daddy, how long do you think we're going to stay here? Angela asked in the high-pitched voice of a curious seven-year-old. I grunted and shook my head, taken aback by the question. Angel was sitting at the pockmarked and scarred kitchen table, coloring a picture with markers. I glanced out the small kitchen window. The ancient, yellowed glass changed the world outside into a sickly, piss-colored hue. After heaving a deep sigh, I turned to Angela, meeting her glacier blue eyes. Until I can get caught up, I said weakly, shrugging. I'm sorry, but this is all I can afford right now. Everything's going to be hard for a while for both of us, I think. Angela blinked quickly, looking confused. She put a warm hand on my arm and leaned close to me. But I like it here, Daddy, she said, giving me a wide smile, her large eyes sparkling with happiness. I have my best friend here. I gave her a double take. I hadn't seen any other kids her age in the building. Who? I haven't met your friends yet. I said, is it a kid who lives in the building with us? She shook her head, rolling her eyes at how slow and dense her old dad was. Well, my best friend is called Mr. Slither. I see him in the mirrors all the time. He's funny, Daddy. He's really tall and has these black clothes on. His face is empty because his eyes are on his hands. There's nothing on his face but a big smile. Mr. Slither is always happy and smiling. Angela murmured excitedly pointing her small hand at the bathroom. What do you mean his eyes are on his hands? I asked. Angela raised her hands to me, her palms outwards. They're right here, she said, pointing to the exact center of each palm. They're really big too, and they never blink. I don't think Mr. Slither even has eyelids. Kinda weird, but I know Mr. Slither would never hurt me. He's a gentle giant. I laughed, relieved. I realized she was just talking about an imaginary friend. You have quite an imagination, kiddo, I said, grinning at her as I ruffled her straight black hair. I used to have an imaginary friend when I was your age, too. His name was Blinko. I thought back with nostalgia, remembering the clown I had imagined and spent hours playing with in those lonely years. Actually, looking back on it, it had a slightly creepy undertone, now that I thought about it. Perhaps having creepy imaginary friends just ran in the family. Mr. Slither is an imaginary, Angela cried defensively, her pale eyes blazing with a childish sense of indignation. For a moment, though, she looked much older than Seven. He's real. At night, he comes out of the mirror and plays with me sometimes. Uh-huh, I said, nodding. Okay, Angela, you're right. Mr. Slither is real. Now go to bed. Santa's coming tonight. I looked down at my watch, seeing it was almost midnight. Christmas would be here soon. After I read Angela a story from Grimm's fairy tales and tucked her into bed, I was sitting in front of a 24-hour news channel, watching the same segments over and over told in slightly different ways. 
Insomnia had been my constant companion for years, ever since my wife, Angela's mother, had been murdered in our old home. I had come home from mini golfing with Angela to find a scene from a nightmare. My wife's body had been laying on the living room floor, slumped and leaning against the front door, as if with her last dying strength she had tried to drag herself outside for help. Her throat had been slashed from ear to ear, nearly severing her head from her body. The pool of blood that surrounded her like a mystical aura gave the air a smell of copper and iron, mixed with the reek of panicked sweat. She had been stabbed dozens of times in her chest, neck, and stomach. I remember Angela's wail as she saw what remained of her mother laying there like discarded trash on the floor. In my dreams, I still see my wife's sightless eyes and hear that horrified, childish screaming. And that's why, I believe, I rarely sleep anymore. And when I do, I always see horrible things. My eyes felt heavy, and everything felt slow as I sat there on the recliner. The TV screen flickered with its incessant babble. When was the last time I had gotten a good night's sleep? Maybe a couple weeks ago, but I couldn't remember. My brain felt sluggish and far away. I closed my eyes, and for a moment, my head drooped. Sleep started to take over like a blanket, covering my body in its warm embrace. Though deep down, I knew dark things swimming deep under the surface of my conscious mind waited for me there as well. A sudden pounding on my door caused me to jump, a feeling like electricity running through my body as a rush of adrenaline made me fully alert. I raised my head, blinking fast. Someone started screaming, a woman's voice, high-pitched and filled with terror. I couldn't make out many words except for help and get it away. I ran over the small, dingy apartment to the door. Without hesitation, I flung it open. A young woman in her twenties with the look of a gypsy stood there. She had dark red lipstick slashed across her lips and eyes that looked painted on and ancient, like those of a doll. Makeup blanketed her tanned face. Dark rivulets of mascara dribbled down her high cheekbones. She ran past me into the apartment, slamming the door shut before I could even react. I saw she was dressed in skin-tight leather and high heels, as if she were coming from a club, or perhaps working as an escort. Thank God you answered, she cried, grabbing my shirt, her eyes frantic and haunted. A brief flash of recognition flashed through my mind. I had seen this woman before, had even talked to her briefly and introduced myself. I remembered her name was Crystal. Though the last time I had glimpsed her in front of the building, she had not been dressed like this. What is this? I asked. Why are you here? She leaned forward, and I could smell alcohol on her breath. There's someone in my apartment, she whispered. Or maybe I should say something, I don't know. I got back from work, and when I opened the door it stood there in the darkness. It was dark, but I could tell it was huge, its head nearly scraping the ceiling. Its head jerked toward me, but it looked like it had no face. God, it was horrible. I shook my head, disgusted. You smell like pure booze, I said, frowning. What are you doing, drugs? I don't need this shit in here. I have a kid. You need to leave immediately. She shook her head frantically. I swear to God this was real. Go look, please, Crystal wailed. She grabbed me with her freshly painted nails. They gleamed in the dim light, blood red and glossy. Suddenly, Angela was standing in our short hallway in her pajamas, looking half asleep. Her eyes moved blearily from me to Crystal and then back to me. Daddy, what's wrong? She asked in a soft voice. Who's this? Okay, you need to leave right now, I said, pushing Crystal towards the door. I flung it open. I saw in wonder that the hallway outside had gone completely dark since Crystal had first run in my place. All of the lights had just winked out, as if the power had been cut. Only a few slivers of moonlight shining through the hallway windows offered any illumination at all. There was a strange smell, too. An odor that hadn't been there a minute earlier when I had let Crystal in. It reminded me of a combination of vomit and antifreeze, and it was overpowering. It emanated from the hallway so thick that I could taste it at the back of my throat. Gagging, I stumbled away from the open door. Oh God, that's the thing, Crystal whispered grimly next to me. 
That's the same smell I noticed when I opened my apartment door. It must be close. Crystal backpedaled away from the threshold that looked in on us like a dilated pupil. She slammed into a wall, knocking a family photo to the floor where it shattered. I continued staring into the darkness, slowly backing away. Something seemed to move in the shadows, like currents of blackness swirling in the void. I heard someone scream from out in the hallway, an old man's quavering voice. There was a pounding of footsteps, then someone ran past my door. I caught a glimpse of a man in a white bathrobe with deep slices across his face and neck. Fat drops of blood collected and scattered over his thin frame as he hobbled forward, staining his bathrobe in spatters and blotches. I heard a predatory shrieking from directly outside. An inhumanly long arm stretched out across the darkness, the pale skin shining like bones in the moonlight. With a cry of agony and terror, the old man got dragged back. The sharp, pointed fingers were embedded deeply in his skin like ticks, creating fresh streams of blood that spurted from the stab wounds. With a rising sense of revulsion and horror, I slammed the door shut. What the fuck is that thing? Crystal whispered as tears streamed down her face, smearing her makeup and mascara. Angela whimpered softly behind us. I ran over to her, wrapping my arms around her in a tight hug. It's okay, baby, I said in her ear. We're going to get you out of here, I promise. No, Daddy, you don't understand, Angela said between sobs. That's Mr. Slither. I don't know why he's doing this, though. He told me he was hungry, but I thought he meant food. I pulled away from her quickly, holding her at arm's length. Her small lips quivered with emotion. Tears pooled in her deep blue eyes. I just shook my head, unbelieving. I pulled out my cell phone, calling 911. It rang a couple times before someone picked up. We need help immediately. I whispered frantically into the phone, a great sense of relief washing over me. Now, at least it would be the authorities' problem, not just mine. Please, there's something attacking people at... Let me in. A ragged voice hissed on the other end of the line. Let me in, or I'll break in. And that will be very unpleasant for all of you, I can assure you. The thing's voice came across as gurgling and deep, as if some sort of acid had eaten away at his vocal cords. My trembling hand dropped the phone to the ground as the electricity in my apartment cut out, plunging us into blackness. Is it real? I whispered in the silence. The dim light of the phone illuminated Angela's face in a ghastly glow. She continued to cry and whimper, apologizing over and over. I stumbled over to her, holding her close. Baby, whatever's happening, it's not your fault. I said, trying to reassure her. Her small body continued to tremble as I held her. Crystal came over to us, confused. What's she talking about? She asked. I shook my head. It's nothing. It's her imaginary friend, Mr. Slither. She thinks he's come to life and is hunting people or something, I said. Angela pulled away, anger coloring her pale cheeks red. He's not imaginary, she said, nearly shouting. I winced. Okay, okay, I believe you, but please stop yelling, I whispered, fear gripping my heart. Whatever kind of animal or whatever that is outside, we don't want to draw its attention. Crystal knelt down in front of Angela, her expression open and believing. Are you telling the truth, Angela? Crystal asked. Have you seen that thing before? Have you even talked to it? Angela nodded, suddenly looking scared and recalcitrant. Okay, well, if you've talked to it, did it tell you what it wants? It's a hey, Angela whispered grimly. Not an it. His name's Mr. Slither and he likes to play. His favorite game, though, is hide-and-seek. I picked up my phone, using the dim light from the screen to see my way. I looked back toward the door, realizing it now stood open. The shadows of the hallway danced and fluttered as I flicked my light in that direction. On the threshold of the doorway, I saw fingers wrapped around the edge, spidery and as sharp as scalpels. The bone-white skin looked so smooth that it didn't seem real, almost like the skin of a mannequin. The hand jerked, twisting towards us. In the center of the palm, I saw an enormous eye, 
It was as dark as obsidian. It looked from me to Angela to Crystal and then, slowly the arm drew back into the hallway and disappeared. Hide and seek, I whispered, herding Angela and Crystal into the bedroom. I turned and locked the door, my heart beating a frantic runaway rhythm in my chest. I felt like I might pass out from all the fear and stress. I leaned on the counter, breathing heavily. We're only on the fourth floor, Crystal observed. It could be worse. If we're playing hide and seek, then we probably just need to get outside, right? How hard could that be? I gave her a look as if she was insane. Did you see how fast that thing was? How sharp those fingers looked? They were like knives. I wouldn't want to get in a fight with that thing. I looked over at Angela, a sense of wonder coming over me. She had been right, after all. She had described Mr. Slither as having eyes on his hands, and he had. Angela, do you think you could talk to Mr. Slither? Maybe calm him down and let us go? She shook her head, terror ripping its way across her pale face. No, Daddy, he's never been like this. He's always been nice. He would play with me all night sometimes. He's really good at Jenga, because his fingers are so long and narrow, Angela said, shrugging. I don't know why he's doing this. Maybe something's imitating Mr. Slither, or gotten inside him. I felt skeptical. Well, we can't just stay in here all night, I whispered grimly. We have to go out. Why? Crystal said, almost petulantly. Why can't we stay in here all night? I'm not going out in that fucking hallway with that thing killing people. Are you totally nuts? Do you want to die? No, I said. And that's why we need to move. If he's playing hide and seek, then he already knows where we are. It's only a matter of time until he comes in here, and the game ends for us. As if on cue, I heard a floorboard creaking outside in the apartment. Goosebumps rose all over my skin, as if a freezing wind had just blown in the room. While I didn't have any guns, I did have a bowie knife I had bought for hiking. It had a giant blade and a silver handle that unscrewed to reveal matches and a compass. I grabbed it, my knuckles turning white with tension as I held the knife in an iron grip. The lock on the door started to turn, as if by itself. The door creaked open slowly. Crystal pulled out her phone, shining the light towards the threshold. Let's do this, I whispered. I started towards the door with stiff legs, having to force myself to take every step. Crystal and Angela were huddled close behind me as I shone the light into the apartment. To my relief, I saw nothing there. We're going to make a run for the stairs and get the hell out of here, I said. Go! Without waiting to see if they would follow, I took off across the apartment and out into the hallway, shining my cell phone in front of me to see. The old man's body was strewn across the floor. To my horror, I saw his jaw had been ripped off and his head twisted around 180 degrees. He had a grisly death mask of terror eternally frozen on his mutilated face. The stairway was only 30 or 40 feet away. I was ecstatic, having seen no sign of the abomination. I glanced behind me, seeing Angela and Crystal not far away. Everything was going perfectly. As we got close, the stairway door flew open with a crack like a gunshot, slamming hard against the wall. Mr. Slither oozed over the threshold, dressed in a silky black robe that fluttered around his inhumanly tall, emaciated body. Staggering, his joints twisting and cracking, he came forwards, one arm extended out as the eye in his palm gleamed like shadows. All three of us turned to run. I sprinted past Crystal, pushing Angela forward as I went. We leapt over the body of the old man, blindly turning the corner. From behind me I heard something heavy fall with a whooshing of breath. I glanced back, seeing Crystal had stumbled over the old man's body. She started crawling forwards as Mr. Slither glided toward his next meal, his bone-white face grinning with pleasure and bloodlust. Don't you dare leave me here, you fucking asshole! Crystal shrieked at me as I sprinted away. Then the screaming started, echoing through the halls with incomprehensible pain. We heard Crystal's screams get cut off abruptly. They were followed by a sickening, choking, gurgling sound. Shaking and terrified, I pushed Angela forward towards the emergency exit. We spiraled our way down the stairs without looking back. 
We had a head start on Mr. Slither now, at least, though I didn't know for how long. The pounding of heavy footsteps closed in behind me. I heard Mr. Slither give a predatory shriek that gurgled like pneumonia. Angela and I had made it to the first floor. I smashed through the door, the metal slamming hard against the wall. The exit was so close, just down the hallway. Angela was weeping, and I was praying. Another forty feet and we would be out. I felt the clawed hands close around my shoulder suddenly, pulling me back and off my feet. They stabbed deeply through the skin and muscle. Mr. Slither turned me to face his eyeless, abominable face. I raised the knife, stabbing it into the top of his head. Gray blood the color of granite exploded in a waterfall from the wound as the knife stuck there, vibrating. Mr. Slither didn't react in the slightest. The mouth split open, showing hundreds of fangs that grew like tumors from his blackened gums. Gnashing and biting the air, he drew me towards that mouth, and I knew I would die. Mr. Slither, don't take my daddy, Angela cried, running towards the abomination. Take me instead, we can play together forever. Mr. Slither's fingers seemed to tighten around my shoulder, digging deeply into the flesh like venomous fangs. A cold, burning sensation shot through my body. I gasped as he dropped me. I fell to my knees, feeling his fingers still clawing my flesh, when he suddenly relaxed, releasing me in an instant. He turned towards Angela, putting his hand out in front of his body to watch her with a single black eye. You would want to spend eternity with me? Mr. Slither gurgled in his infected voice. Angela nodded, hugging the black-robed figure. Mr. Slither put his hands on her back uncertainly, then started patting her gently. His pointed alien skull split into a wide grin with a cracking sound. Angela, no! I cried as blood poured down my chest. My clothes stuck to my skin as it soaked into my shirt in blotches. I tried to push myself up, but I felt weak and sick. Crouched on the ground in the darkness, I could only watch in horror as they walked off down the hallway together, hand in hand. I would never see Angela again. That's a wrap for today on The Midnight Mystery. Hope you guys had as much fun as we did. If you liked what you saw, hit that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up. Oh, and don't be shy. Drop a comment below with your thoughts or any cool mystery ideas you want us to check out. Until next time, we'll see you in the next Midnight Mystery.